and that was when I like something clicked in me. I, I realized that hey, you don't really have to really go down the same route as everybody has, and you can actually do something you love and make a living too. During, do I go back to Singapore to pursue a full time job, or should I give myself a period of time to turn this blog into a full time business? So the moment I made this switch. And really focused in on my blog. I gave myself three months, and I really treated the blog like a business. I was so much you can earn if you are tying your value to the time. So yeah, so this like with blogging, you know the the it, how much you can earn is really limitless. Hello and welcome to HR Connections. Our channel is dedicated to finding success factors of professionals and business owners at the top of their game. In today's episode, we have a very successful travel blogger. Isabella Leon. She's originally from Singapore. She's been to 45 different countries already. And today she will be discussing about the lifestyle and the way she's been very successful at it. So stick around, we'll be right back. everyone welcome back we have isabel joining us from costa rica isabel how are you today hi i'm doing well how are you i'm doing very well thank you for joining us yeah hi. thanks for having me <laughs> okay perfect um so i just want to dive right into it you know a little bit of your background if you will what basically motivated you to become a travel blogger yeah, so it really started with me going on a school exchange um, when I was in university. It was like a semester abroad and I chose to go to France. Um, so I'm originally from Singapore. I'm a Singaporean 100%. And like this opportunity for me to go abroad um, to somewhere far away was really exciting for me. And being able to spend six months in Europe, which is the first time that I would ever be, was like a very exciting pros exciting idea. And so I decided to create a blog to share my experiences and to share like my pictures back when Instagram wasn't a thing. And so, yeah, that's how my travel blog was born. <laughs> Excellent. So um, once your travel blog was born, I think initially you had done sort of like smaller trips. It wasn't like a full-time mm -hmm. thing initially, right? Yeah, um, I would say I really started as a child with my family. We would go on maybe annual trips together to close by countries in Asia or maybe Australia. I've always like been someone who just like brought along my journal to document whenever I go on trips. So like journaling really came pretty naturally to me. Yeah, and so that's why I thought like, you know, starting a blog and like writing about my journeys and sharing itineraries all came all came naturally to me. Okay. And when did you make the decision that, you know, this is the lifestyle you wanted to pursue, you wanted to see mm -hmm. the world and do all that? Like, when was that? Yeah, so remember I told you about that trip to Europe? I did all sorts of things that I never thought I would or I never could in Singapore, like couch surfing, like meeting different people from all walks of life. In Singapore, like it's generally quite um, standard, like where people, you know, when they graduate, they start work, they usually work in corporate life and then they get a house, settle down with a family. But then when I was in Europe, like I was traveling France, I was traveling Belgium, all sorts of places. I actually tried couch surfing. And that was when I was exposed to people of various backgrounds, like musicians, like artists. And that was when I, like something clicked in me. I, I realized that, hey, you don't really have to really go down the same route as everybody has. And you can actually do something you love and make a living too. And so with that, I, I thought that, yeah, I want to be able to travel more. Can I do that with my travel blog? And so it wasn't, it was just a seed. It was just an idea in my mind. It wasn't really something that I considered seriously because back then like blogging is kind of a hobby. So then um, 
it really just grew as I grew my traffic and then and as I got and I immersed myself in other blogger in the blogging space that was when I realized that hey there are actually some bloggers that are doing this full time and so that really that really became a goal of mine to build my blog to be one that's professional and one that I can earn a full time income with Okay, so many uh, things you have said that um, I want to sort of pick apart yeah. and uh, yeah. you know get to know a little yeah. more about. Um, I think the first thing is that you said that you know how to transition from a hobby to something mm -hmm. which is more like something you do for a living, right? Mm -hmm. That you do it professionally. So that's one. The other thing which you mentioned was you grew traffic or you built up traffic for your blog and that's how you started making money and mm -hmm. that's how you can choose the lifestyle that you have. So perhaps, you know, shed some light on how did you transition from a hobby to something which is more professional and then how did you actually grow uh, the traffic? Yeah, for me, it was very clear cut. Um, there was this point in my life where I was like, okay, do I, so I, I had this period where I was at a turning point and I was considering, do I go back to Singapore to pursue a full-time job or should I give myself a period of time to turn this blog into a full-time business? So the moment I made this switch and really focused in on my blog, I gave myself three months and I really treated the blog like a business. I was all about um, making it work. So the moment I had this mental switch, that was when like my blog really flourished. I got really serious with the traffic. I got really serious with um, working as a professional blogger rather than a hobby blogger. And so, yeah. And so that was the point where it really changed everything for me, where like I was no longer just blogging for fun, but I was very strategic and I was like very intentional. And, and then, yeah, that was when everything really clicked together and I, I managed to turn this into a full-time income hobby. And then with that, I was able to like prove to at least my parents back home that, hey, if I'm able to make a full-time income blogging, I can literally blog from anywhere and be able to travel wherever I want. Okay, perfect. So obviously... Um you've traveled to 45 different countries already. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the things, uh, there is some curiosity around this, is that if someone wanted to actually um, change uh, their sort of outlook in terms of going from hobby to more professional, as you said, that you were more strategic and things like mm -hmm. that, can you share some tips for anyone who's looking to do this? Yeah, you definitely want to have the end in mind. Really think about what you want to achieve with, say, a website or a blog. Is that something that um, you really like to talk about passionately, that you, you know, in the long term, you would be able to blog endlessly about that same topic? And what do you hope to achieve? Like in terms of, do you want to get more lifestyle freedom out of having... Um, a flexible income? Do you want to get more passive income so that you're able to not tie down work with, not tie down the number of hours you work with the amount that you earn? So with that, like, because blogging, it gives you boundless opportunities. Like there's no limit on how much you can earn as long as you know how to do it right. So yeah, having an end in mind, you are then able to work backwards and then come up with a plan like whether it's a content strategy plan or or a marketing plan okay all right uh, very well said that um you know you gotta um, basically decide on your strategy and go from there um so having been to so many different countries and um i'm sure you have come across a lot of different challenges in mm -hmm. each of these uh countries so um, could you share with us in general, like, you know, some of these challenges which have come about and how did you handle those? Oh, yeah. Um, having traveled for over a year nonstop as a digital nomad around South America, 
all of last year. I've had a few mishaps or, or two, like um, being one of it was uh, when I was in Mexico and I was supposedly sleeping at a friend's house. And then the next morning when, when I woke up, I found all of my belongings missing. So that was like a really frightening scare. And I was traveling alone at that time. Um, this friend, I was a friend that I met in a mutual group online. So I didn't really know him. Um, so that was scary because like he was supposed to be my friend and the only person that I really like was in touch with or the only person that I knew in that city. So yeah, that, that made me really vulnerable. And also like a couple months ago, um, I was living in an Airbnb in the Dominican Republic and somehow I was traveling with my boyfriend at, t- at that time and I woke up at like four or five o'clock in the morning because the, 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 it started pouring and you know I was groggy with sleep. I went out into the living room and I found the main door wide open and that was when I, I did a double take because I was still groggy with sleep and then I switched on the lights and then I found like uh, I found a mess on the ground like my stuff and like our stuff was strewn all over the floor so I got a shock and that was when I realized that our house had been burglared in so yeah it's been like it's, it's sometimes you get these crazy stories that as much as you take precaution you can never really you have to yeah you can never really like prevent such freak accidents and so it really takes a lot of um adaptability and trying to make the best of things uh, in order to you know survive it out there and be traveling long term on your own especially mm-hmm, mm-hmm. understood yeah those were very challenging mm-hmm. times um but um obviously you made it through so thank god for that um yeah. but even with all these challenges you still have to keep working Right. Because Mm -hmm. uh, there could be, you know, like um, spotty Wi-Fi or even no Wi-Fi, I'm sure, at some Mm -hmm. places. But you still have to keep on working. So um, I think a lot of people would be curious to know are what are some of the services that you offer? Yeah. So services as in like. So besides working on my blog, because of how well the traffic, how well it's been received on Google search and things like that, sometimes I get um, businesses approaching me asking for help with online presence. Like for instance, I was um, in Mexico uh, last year and I was actually working with a tour company as a travel blogger, you know, doing a like a collaboration with a travel blogger, uh, with a travel company where I would promote that promote their tour in exchange for a complimentary tour that they would give us so when they found out that I am good at um, really ranking on Google they actually then you know reached out to me saying that hey you know because of the pandemic um, no one's walking into our stores anymore it's getting harder and harder to find customers because everyone's just doing their research online before coming to Mexico coming to this town and by the time they come to this town they already have someone in mind to work with because of the research that they did online so that was when like I came on board to help them to optimize their online presence and yeah I do things like that and through working together like in the past year within six months I was able to like six times their traffic so they've been really pleased with that result and they are getting more and more customers or at least inquiries from overseas before they even enter Mexico. Excellent. Those are great results. So yeah. so obviously you work with various different types of companies across the world, um, promoting different kinds of products and things like that. Um, so how do you normally negotiate these deals because i'm sure that you know you you may have your standard fees but from client to client and from country to country these might be very different so uh, yeah. how do you go about negotiating these deals yeah i've realized that you know traveling around south america and especially during the pandemic um like in south america you know the standard of living is much lower some of them are from third world countries and they want to promote their company very much, but sometimes they have limited means to do so. So I'm usually pretty flexible. Like 
for me personally, the reason why I started a travel blog was to really be more immersive with different cultures and to really be able to experience more things outside of my comfort zone. And so for me, it's not all about like money or profit. And sometimes, and, and that's why sometimes I would work on a butter trade basis where maybe they would offer a service or an accommodation for free. And in exchange, I would help to promote them based on based on the social media and the platforms that I've grown and nurtured my audience uh, to really enjoy like my audience of travel lovers. So basically, like not only do I get to promote local tourism, which I'm which I'm really passionate about, but I'm also able to provide value and I'm also able to provide unique um, angles towards certain certain countries in terms of travel to my audience as well. So it's kind of like a win-win situation. Okay. Okay. Very nice. Very nice. Um, so one of the other things which a lot of people are curious about is um, visa issues. Uh, do you face a lot of visa issues as you travel from country to country and you live for uh, short periods of time? Yeah, before embarking on this long-term travel, with Singapore being the one of the strongest passports, I never really had to worry about visa at all, to the point where sometimes I, like, I take it for granted. But then now when I travel, because I travel a bit more long-term, like I would stay for as long as the visa allows me in Mexico, it allows me for six months. In like Bolivia, most places it's like three months, 90 days. So with that, I have to be more careful. I have to really do my research before going to a place. Um, I've had like, even though Singapore is such a strong passport, because I travel to South America, where I guess not many Singaporeans travel there, a lot of, more than a couple times, <laughs> I've had, I've been stopped at the customs because they were like, what passport is this? Are you even allowed to enter? Um, so yeah, it's been complicated. But I mean, as long as you do your research beforehand and like you do all the due diligence, usually um, usually you should not be able to, you shouldn't have to face visa issues. The only time I did was, um, the only two times I did was like entering Bolivia I need to pay for a visa on arrival. And because I was staying there for three months, I actually had to go to the visa, the, the visa company to extend my visa. And then, yeah, there are a lot of hidden information that you don't really know. Like when I was in Peru, um, by right, I had 90 days. But because of the number of days that the customs gave me upon arrival, I had to pay an extra 15 days because they said that, oh, um, the customs gave you only 30 days to stay, but you stayed for 45 days. Therefore, you have to pay for the extra 15 days you overstayed. So that was very frustrating because I clearly did not um, flout any rules, but then the customs only gave me 30 days, which I didn't know until I had to pay when I, when I leave the country. So yeah, it's all these detailed details that you have to know. And that really taught me to ask upon arrival to a new country, how many days am I legal to, am I allowed to stay in that country? Okay. All right. So speaking of little things, and these are not necessarily little things, but mm -hmm. um, renting apartments in a mm -hmm. new country, uh, especially countries where you don't speak the local language, right? or uh, phones or, you know, uh, credit cards or banking stuff. Like, how do you manage those things? Yeah, so with accommodation, um, I think it differs for every country, but at least in Central and South America, I try not to go with Airbnb or booking or, you know, stay in hotels if I'm staying long term for at least a month. I found that, you know, Facebook groups actually are a great resource to look for apartments for long-term stays in, in Central and South America. So that has been a really great help with cutting down costs, you know, especially like if you're wanting to book on Airbnb, you have to pay for service costs, you have to pay for all the little extra fees that they charge. So yeah, going direct to owners always help. And with banking, I use an international 
like I use a multi-currency card that anybody can use. It's not tied to your citizenship. It's called WISE. So there are two options, WISE and Revolut. And it's super easy because basically as long as you have, it's acts as a debit card. So as long as you have cash, no, as long as you have money in, in that card, you can basically draw from any ATMs in the world in the local currency in the in that day's exchange rate. So in the actual exchange rate without incurring much fees at all. And I found that to be really the most cost-effective way when it comes to managing different currencies. Um, with regards to language, yeah, I've been traveling in Spanish-speaking countries and I have to admit it has not been easy. Um, the good thing about my experience is that I was traveling with my boyfriend and he speaks Spanish, so that was that was helpful. But otherwise, I found that having a translate app on the phone is handy. So yeah, whenever you need to make exchanges with a local, you can always use the Google Translate app to to like to get around. So it's it's not been yeah, it's definitely still manageable. It's still something that you can work around. It's not like, oh, because I don't speak their language, um, that shouldn't deter you from visiting a country. Okay. All right. Perfect. Um, I really like your upbeat and positive attitude. Mm -hmm. And I guess you have to have those things, especially when you're traveling to all these different countries and you face all these different kind of situations. Um, one thing I think a lot of our viewers would be interested to know is um, about Google search because mm -hmm. um, everybody is looking to get uh, on that top spot in Google, you know, on page one and all that mm -hmm. stuff. So a lot of new businesses or even solopreneurs, people who are promoting their own business, um, what do you recommend initially for them to uh, not necessarily rank on first page on Google, mm -hmm. but at least start that process? What do you recommend? Yeah, so you really have to get clear on your target audience, I would say. that was That's going to be the very first thing. Uh -huh. Say you already have um, a field that you want to talk about, like you already have your business. Maybe it's a hair salon and your hair salon specializes in children haircuts. So then you know that you are targeting, you know, like moms or, yeah, moms of toddlers, that sort of thing. And if you have a specific location that you are targeting, in a specific city, then that's also one um, one uh, category to narrow down your target audience. And then from there, really do your keyword research, especially if, let's say, you want uh, to establish a presence online on Google search or Yahoo search on the search engines. You then want to establish, like, and you then want to do your keyword research to make sure that these moms of toddlers in Singapore, the kind of keywords that they are, the kind of keywords that they are um, typing to search for when they are looking for a hair salon. And so from there, you would be much, um, much able to not just target your audience, but know the keywords that they're looking for, the key phrases that they're typing to search for a hair salon. And then from there, sprinkle the keywords all around your website to begin with. Okay, uh, very good info uh, for anyone who's uh, starting out and looking to basically build a presence online. Um, tell us about some of the joys of mm -hmm. uh, this kind of a lifestyle. Oh, it's super flexible. That's what I love about it, mm -hmm. first and foremost. Like you mentioned, you know, having spotty Wi Fi, and because I work online, definitely that's an issue. But then also there is room for flexibility in that like I don't have to work five days a week, seven hours a day. I can literally work anytime I want. If I'm in a place with spotty Wi-Fi, I can just simply choose to plug off completely and just enjoy the beach and, and do outdoor activities, that sort of thing. So it's, it's very flexible because also I'm earning passive income where like I could be getting traffic um, even when I'm asleep and with traffic, I get advertising revenue. Um, yeah, I get eyeballs to my website and potential advertisers wanting to advertise with me. So it's a really flexible schedule. You're not tying your worth to time. 
in that like if you are servicing a client and you're billing workable hours, there's only so much time that you can work in a day or in a month, in a week. And there's only so much you can earn if you are tying your value to the time. So yeah, so this like with blogging, you know, the, the it, how much you can earn is really limitless. And you also get to prioritize your own wellness very much. You don't have to, you know, be a slave to your job. So then you can have a good mix of work-life balance. So that's really nice. And then, I mean, in the aspect of travel, being able to work as a travel blogger, I get to experience things that I otherwise would not have ever been able to experience. Like I went white shark cage diving in South Africa. That was a super cool experience. I was able to like go paragliding, go skydiving, walk on ice glaciers, all because of the blog. So it really is like not just giving you a life of freedom, but also giving you a life of fun. Awesome. Those were uh, great experiences, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. um, so you went to school in Singapore. Uh, once you graduated, you could have had a career um, and had a career which was very linear as well, right? Um, but you chose not to do that. So what are some of these sacrifices that you had to do in order to have the life that you do right now? Yeah, so one challenge is really that your income is not stable as compared to a salary job. It's not like you're earning the same amount every year, which is a good and bad thing because like you can have you can be earning as much as you can, you want. But also during the pandemic, because traffic plummeted, no one was willing to advertise. It, I really did suffer a huge hit from the pandemic where no one's searching about travel anymore. And so I also had nothing to write about. And so that was a quite a, quite a depressing period for me. But then recovering from it, now my traffic is even higher than even before the pandemic happened. So it was just a temporary lull, I guess. Um, the other thing is, I guess stability is another thing, another thing that I had to sacrifice where some days I wish I just had a base for me to dump all of my stuff. I don't have to worry about shopping because I don't have, like, because I have a wardrobe and I don't have to fit everything into my luggage. So that can be a bit inconvenient. Um, yeah, and sometimes like it takes time for me to settle into one place and I don't want to have to keep thinking about moving from place to place because uh, it can be at times when I'm, when I'm traveling too much, I can actually suffer from travel burnout where I just feel like being in one place and not doing anything anymore. Okay. All right. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, so um, if people wanted to find you, uh, what would be the best way to find you? Yeah, so it's best to find me on my travel blog, bellaroundtheworld.com. You can find all sorts of travel guides, food guides, um, blogging tips, my free SEO course, uh -huh. introduction training, as well as all my social media profiles. I'm pretty active on Instagram. I usually share my day-to-day -day life on Instagram stories. So that's also the best place to connect with me. Excellent. All that information will be in the description box below. Um, and we'll include that link uh, to the free training, as she has mentioned. Um, so before we go, Isabel, um, any final words? Oh, I would say if you're hesitating, just do it. Because a lot of, a lot of the times, what our biggest fears are really just in our heads. And I see a lot of people wanting to do a certain thing, like wanting to live a certain lifestyle, but there are so many things holding them back, like, oh, whether it's responsibilities, whether it's the finances, whether it's the weather whatsoever, whether it's like shitty Wi-Fi, but all of these are just in your head and there's always a way to work around it. You'll be more surprised. You'll be actually surprised that, you know, sometimes moving, like having a change in environment would do you more good than harm, even though, it is uneasy to be to step out of your comfort zone, but being able to like stretch your own boundaries, it is not just a it's not just a physical thing, but it's also um it's also a mental, like mental personal development and it's great for the body and soul. Awesome. 
very nice uh, things to say. Um, thank you so much uh, for your time today. I really appreciate that. Uh, all her details, uh, as I said, will be in the description box below. And Isabel, I wish you all the best in your uh, next adventure. Thank you, and thanks for having me. Thanks for watching. We really appreciate that. If you like what you saw, then hit the like button. If there is a type of professional you want featured on our channel, then leave a comment below and we'll try our best. And going forward, we'll be posting at least once or twice every week, so subscribe to the channel. And we'll see you on the next one.